Now, journal journalists are right now trying to portray, uh, trying to demonize Venezuela in another way. What are they doing, Paul? What are they doing in Venezuela? What is happening in Venezuela? <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is an interesting story that comes to us from the gray zone. And uh, so the, an interesting and very unusually open interview with a sort of Western media reporter that's based in Caracas. So the article says, one Caracas-based correspondent now working for the New York Times told me on the record that he employs sexy tricks to hook readers on dubious articles demonizing socialist, the socialist government of Venezuela. Anatoly Kermanev, which is totally an American sounding name, I wonder why they're not trying to go after him for R Russia reasons, but um, Duh. he made this revealing comment and many more during the interview I conducted with him for my PhD book on the media coverage of Latin America. At the time, he was a correspondent for Bloomberg and had just published a very dubious story on how condoms supposedly cost $750 per pack in Venezuela. The misleading article was picked up and repeated across the media, describing himself and his colleagues as mercenaries. Kermanev uh, was unabashed, boasting on tape that he essentially grossly exaggerates stories in the media. Quote, a couple of times from my experience, you try to use, I wouldn't call them cheap tricks, but yeah, kind of sexy tricks. Just last week, we had a story about condom shortages in Venezuela and the official exchange rate, condoms were like $750 or something, and the headline was something like $750 condom in Venezuela, and everyone clicks it and everyone says, Jesus, why do they sell it for like $750? He said, once you click, the average reader is hooked and he'll read about really important issues like HIV prevention problems in Venezuela and teen pregnancies and social impact of lack of contraception, the public health impact, Things I do feel are important to tell the world, but you have to use sexy tactics to do it. Um, he goes on to talk about how Western media has had uh, a demonstrable effect on the economy of Venezuela, that the sanctions and embargoes have, well, the embargo wasn't in, in place at the time, but between 2017 and 2018, we can attribute 40,000 deaths in Venezuela to the sanctions that came from the U.S. government. And the U.S. government and U.S. media has repeatedly referred to Maduro as a dictator and part of a troika of tyranny, also invoking Russia, uh, and, sp and has sponsored multiple coup attempts there, including one in November. So what's interesting uh, is, let's see, where does, it, where does he get into this? The, the condoms cost $750, $750 thing. We don't learn until the ninth paragraph of the article that a pack of condoms actually cost about the same as it did in the United States at the time. The, at the latter piece of the pseudo news is based on a deliberate distortion of the country's admittedly Byzantine currency regulations and its effect on demonizing the government and socialism in general, advancing the idea that something must be done to help them. So they're taking a, a kind of wonky, weird currency exchange rule extrapolating it to a, a consumer item that has to do with sex because that's going to get people to click on it. They weren't finding that condoms cost this much. They were taking a corner piece, let, you know, rule in the government that maybe wasn't great. You could, you could write an article about, hey, maybe their currency exchange could use some smoothing out because it has some inefficiencies here or there. But no, nope, you know, we need to tell everyone that there aren't adequate prophylactics to use in Venezuela and their teen pregnancies all over the place as a result of it, which is not true. You're just making that up. Uh, the article goes on to talk about how this reporter went on to report in Bolivia and did essentially the same things. According to the correspondent's narrative, according to uh, RE Bolivia, which conveniently echoed Washington's official live, the ouster of Morales left a power vacuum that re uh, reluctant Añez was forced to fill with a transitional government. It's completely omitting the fact that there was a military coup that installed that person. It wasn't a power vacuum, it was a coup. They go to great lengths to not refer to it as a coup. Um, he, he's pointing out basically the the terms in which these uh, reporters are going to Venezuela. And I thought the, the closing paragraphs of the article were, were very telling. It says, with pressure from all sides to, to serve as stenographers for right-wing opposition movements, many Western correspondents exist in a cultural bubble, almost entirely isolated from the poor and working class populations that support leftist governments across Latin America. Western reporters almost universally live and work in the richest areas of capital cities from Venezuela to Mexico, often in gated communities, surrounded by armed guards, and rarely venture into the poorer areas where the majority of people live. 
Some of the corporate media's top correspondents confided to me that they could not even speak Spanish for months after they got there, and were therefore unable to converse with the bottom 90 to 95 percent of the population. They are essentially parachuted in to opposition strongholds to work with opposition activists and naturally take that side of the debate. With all of these factors in mind, the cheerleading across the U.S. press for regime change in Bolivia and Venezuela can hardly be seen as an accident. Too many journalists at corporate media outlets tend to see themselves as the ideological shock troops in an information war against supposedly tyrannical socialist governments, passing off regime change propaganda as unbiased news, and all in a day's work for those embracing their role as servants of the empire. This is the thing, right? This is what it takes if you want to be successful in the current world of Western journalism. Find out what the government line is, find a way to echo it incessantly, uncritically, be a stenographer for those in power, and you will get a pat on the head and a, and a fat paycheck. You'll What's get those nice corner offices at the New York Times or the Washington Post. You spend a couple of years doing your, you know, slumming it in a, in a foreign country where things are really difficult, but don't worry, they're going to put you in a gated community and give you armed guards, and you don't have to speak the language and just talk to our, our friends over here in the opposition, all these rich people that want to make sure that they overthrow the socialist government because, you know, they're not making nearly as much money as when they controlled the oil company. This fucking socialist government's privatizing the goddamn oil. God damn it. And how, how do we feel about the fact that, oh, well, of course that's the position that they take. That's, that's the opinion that they've come away with, that they're, first of all, trying to be sycophantic to their own government. And the only people they're talking to in a foreign government are the wealthiest and most interested parties and completely politically biased in every way. There, it's no wonder that we aren't getting the straight dope out of what's happening in Latin America. All right, so I'm going to keep my response uh, because we're on a time, uh, you know, uh, time element. But um, I want to make it very clear that with this entire coverage of this crisis in Venezuela, I'm, I'm very happy that there's an article like the Gray Zone out there that's actually bringing uh, attention to this, and more importantly, uh, acknowledging the fact that you know corporate media is is profiting off the system. And also, shout out to our Super Chat, Doug Moore, uh, 50 nations, uh, back Guido, UN, 193 nations, 25%. So, man, one, yeah, I, I mean, I'm think that I think that inadvertently, they are the shock troops. I mean, these are what modern day, modern era shock troops look like. They aren't soldiers. It's even before the soldiers. It's the Western journalist that goes in and for years builds up a reputation of, oh, he's the guy that's that uh, we know that's from the New York Times. That's in the uh, this area of the world. He's the guy we can trust. He's this reputable source and he's a New York Times reporter that's going to tell us everything that's happening. And then as soon as you ask them what's going on, it's, well, actually, don't talk to the people. I don't know what's going on. I really talk to the people that are trying to overthrow the government. And I know I'm slumming it out here until I can get back and get a really nice. Yeah. Check out my sexy yeah. tricks. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so it's manufacturing consent. It's manufacturing reality. With, with and we God. are, as America, as Americans and as American companies, literally doing the exact same thing that we say that we're out there to correct. Instead of saying to people, here's what the truth is. I know it. I've looked at all the sides. It's I'm literally going to be the propaganda that I chastise against. So just think about it. How many articles were written in the past where you have these reporters that are in these hostile foreign countries talking about a dictator that we have to overthrow? Think about all the articles that were written, how many wars that we've gotten ourselves into because of articles saying that, oh, this dictator is doing this or it costs this much to have toilet paper or water in this country. I mean, it's just horrible journalism. And that's why we exist here at Hardlands Media, because we have to bring this to light. And thankfully, the Gray Zone brought that to attention, too, because they're so fantastic. Yeah, they are. They are great. And the thing is, it's important for us to remember that if we're going to stop these regime change wars, we have to reorganize how the media is presented to the American people, because the media's job is to inform the people about what's happening. And if there is a dictator out there that's oppressing his people, yeah, we should know about it. But don't put us into a country where we're just there just to take another country's resources. We wouldn't like it if somebody did that to us. And let's face it, if you look at America's track record, we have the highest incarcerated population in the free world. We're polluting our rivers, our soil, our air. We're contaminating our, uh, our entire environment. Our infrastructure is falling apart. And we have such a corrupt, inept, neoliberal system. You know, we could kind of use uh, a much-needed reform here, so maybe some freedom, but... 
I guess we're not going to get it because according to corporate media, everything's fine and peachy here. Daniel. I want to add just a final note on this, and that is just take a step back. I kind of just realized this is obvious, but I think it needs to be said. What kind of super oppressive dictatorship are you in where you can openly write against the country for years and years and years with no repercussions? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I got to mention one more thing from the super chat. Uh, no, it's not a super chat, but from the regular chat. Holly Horn, Venezuela has more oil than Saudi Arabia. You have no idea that's how many times. Prime. You don't have no idea how many times that's mentioned in the season two of Jack Ryan. That's mentioned at least three or four times, I think. They have more oil episode. reserves than any country on yeah, the planet. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they mention it a lot in that episode. Me and Paul are going to do a review on that season, but Paul's slugging through it. It's I, I watched the whole thing. You are going to laugh at the ending. I can't I'm going through it slowly laughing. because I have far too many pages of notes. <laughs> far too many. 